thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to see so many friends. I, uh, I realize that you can give an annual conference and then your friends will show up and uh, it works. It's magic. I love it. Um, so I'm Evan Moglen and uh, this is the Software Freedom Law Center annual fall conference at Columbia Law School. Uh, for those who are uh, jumping on the stream by accident or dropped in for continuing legal education who therefore may not work in our neighborhood and know who we are, let, let, let me introduce us for just a moment. The, the Software Freedom Law Center is a nonprofit educational corporation chartered by the State Education Department of the State of New York and a 501c3 public charity as determined by the USIRS. What we do, uh, from the point of view of the guy who, who has the day job as a law professor, is to teach lawyers, uh, which is the least visible to everybody else who sees a pro bono legal services operation which offers free legal services to the makers and distributors, nonprofit makers and distributors, of free and open source software, that is computer software, made to be copied, modified, and redistributed that by anybody. Software that protects users' rights. But as I say, from my point of view, standing in my own classroom, this feels like a secondary point. So I feel as though I ought to start to introduce this. this as yeah, I feel most days we are this is a teaching practice. The idea of the Software Freedom Law Center from that point of view is uh, that we need people. I won't say who have undergraduate engineering degrees from Georgia Tech and who do free software hacking and who are law students at Columbia University. Thank you, Alice. I appreciate that very much. Oh, Alice is not even a student anymore, a lawyer in being, um, though she has been working with us since she wasn't, which is how it works. You see, the, uh, the idea is that software-capable people in law school who want to learn how to do well by doing good could really use a school to work project which produces people uh, who can do well by doing good in the world of free software. And um, uh, for the last 12 years, from my point of view, term after term and summer after summer, that's what this is. This is a place for training people not just how to do free software law, but how doing creative lawyering in an area like this can lead to better outcomes in life for the now 6,289 law students I have taught over 29 years in this and other similar buildings. There are a number of people in this room, I shan't embarrass them by trying to point out where they come from or disclosing their roots, uh, who passed through that system and who are now uh, out there doing all kinds of wonderful and creative things with technology and sharing and business and rights and all the stuff that ties up into what we do. So SFLC's primary purpose in that sense, from my point of view, is to enable those lawyers to learn new skills about lawyering and join them to technical interests and powers they already had and to go out into the world and increase the peace and establish uh, freedom. I'm sorry to have to be sentimental about it, but that is what I mean, freedom. Uh, so SFLC does that, and it gives away a lot of uh, free legal services, um, which it pays for uh, primarily on the very generous donations of the companies that have made a ton of money uh, out of free software and who understand why it would be good if the rainforest continued to exist and if it wasn't pillaged by selfish people and patent trolls and troublemakers and all the other people who are out there whom sharing is imperiled by one way or another. Um, when, you're a, when, when you're a small bunch of people making some software because you think it's just terrific, and it is, and you get a letter from somebody saying, but I own the idea, so please stop or else, it is good for there to be a lawyer. Uh, and when somebody is telling you that you have to take it down for some complicated para-copyright reason contained in 1201 of the DMCA, and it's good to have a lawyer. And it isn't just that. I mean, it's also true that businesses uh, encrypt stuff. 
uh, because actually you can't have a business without encrypting stuff, and yet there's export control that still exists, even on the free software that we make and give away. And it's sometimes good for businesses to know how not to get in trouble over exporting crypto in the modern world. Um, and, and we do that, and, and, and lawyers are learning. Uh, lawyers are learning plenty because when you do the work we do, you are in a, a sector, but you're not in a specialty. We do trademark and we do patent defense and we do copyright and we do nonprofits organizations and we do offshore tax law, but don't tell anybody. Um, so so it, it, lawyers learn a lot of different things and they learn them in a particular neighborhood which happens to be a place where we think real titanic social value is, namely in software in the network that respects citizens instead of platforms, uh, a problem which uh, people like Richard Stallman and me started worrying about before there were platforms, but we worried about it. So. So that's what the Software Freedom Law Center is, uh, and, and what it is that we do at the annual conference is uh, we bring a lot of our friends together who, who follow this world, and we try and talk about what's just immediately over the horizon. What is the next thing or things that we need to think about? What are the next problems that we're going to be dealing with? It's my opportunity to take what we have learned for a year and, and teach it back in a way which uses all the skills of all the people that we know to help us understand better what we're doing. Um, it, we are uh, going to have a long full program and I'm going to be depriving people of their early Friday evening as it is, so I'm, I'm not gonna say more about introducing us. I, I, I do need to say that we are practitioners of win-win solutions which means that in the choice between free as in freedom and free as in beer, we choose both. Uh, welcome to our free conference, uh, and there is free lunch, uh, and there is free continuing legal education credits, and that means that the beer and the freedom are both as good as we know how to make them free for you. And to this year I need to add a free disclaimer uh, uh, last Thursday evening, by email, I was notified by my dear friends uh, Hal Abelson and Jerry Sussman of the MIT faculty that uh, in the near future, the services of the Software Freedom Law Center would no longer be required as lawyers for the Free Software Foundation. And yesterday evening at 5.15 p.m., FSF published on its website a statement uh, that I had stepped down, effective yesterday as general counsel, of the Free Software Foundation. Um, if you look, you will find that there is no quote from me in the announcement, which means that a miracle has occurred. After 23 years of uh, laboring for and supporting the Free Software Foundation, my comrade Richard Stallman and I have apparently parted, and I have done so without saying anything, which you will admit is the miracle, sure. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it means I can offer a disclaimer that my pal Richard would want me to offer. Nothing that will be said here, actually I must be technically accurate, almost nothing that will be said here today represents the views of Richard Stallman or the Free Software Foundation. And for the first time in a quarter century, I stand here before you uh, not bearing that particular hat among the many hats stacked up on my poor head. Uh, with that in mind, then, I want to talk just a little bit about our program before I start letting it happen. Uh, we're going to spend this morning talking about blockchain. Uh, actually, I hope what we're really going to be talking about is the wealth of technology that lies behind that now slightly over-fashionable word. Uh, and uh, I want to talk about the technology of distributed self-authenticating information meant to be shared in a reliable way. Uh, and uh, the best person in my judgment in the world to do that is here to do it with us. And I want to talk about what it is that um, is uh, important for all of us uh, in a change in software paradigms. Uh, that's going to take the morning, and after free lunch, uh, I want to talk about cars, a wonderful subject. Um, and uh, Jeremiah and I uh, will talk about software in cars. Um, that's liability, that's right to repair, that's the cultural meaning of transportation as a service rather than a product. Um, 
the, the, the single commodity which has most meant freedom to Americans in the long 20th century we have lived through is the car. What happens when the great American commodity symbol of freedom is a robot that picks you up and drives you where you want to go unless something else tells it to go to jail in the meantime? Well, the answer is then the one commodity that will really represent freedom to Americans is the gun, which I do not think is an optimal outcome. So Jeremiah and I are going to try and figure out what we do about that in the interest of freedom that doesn't kill people too much. Um, uh, we then want to talk about uh, GPL compliance, a, uh, a, a very boring subject, but not right this minute. Uh, and um, that, I hope, will make a very good day. Uh, unlike Paul Ryan, I am not here to tell you that I'm not going to discuss the elephant in the room. I'm just going to tell you that I'm going to discuss the elephant in the room at the other end of the program this afternoon, so stay tuned. Don't touch that dial. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Chris didn't, he was already thinking, oh, this is a terrible introduction. Look at the guy, he's just lying about me up one side and down the other. No, I'm not the best person. Well, but he is, and for the following reasons. Uh, uh, so, uh, so Christopher Ferris is uh, 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 an IBM distinguished engineer, and for those of us who were once upon a time undistinguished engineers at IBM, uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a powerful saying. Uh, uh, so that's part of why I'm in, a, in an awestruck mood. Um, uh, uh, but, but, but also because uh, Chris Ferris is the CTO of IBM's uh, technologies in the cloud, which really means the entire future of everything the business does, let's face it, um, uh, and has been doing FOSS stuff uh, since the very end of the 20th century, when a lot of the people in this room all started doing FOSS stuff, and when I discovered that, yeah, my lemonade stand was actually going to get some business, and Richard and I started wondering why it was we were charging zero cents a glass, or at any rate, I started wondering that because I'm the lawyer. Yeah, we made it up. Well, we did make it up in volume. I mean, you have to admit, if that, if that strategy ever works, then we would be terrific now because the volume came just fine, right? And, and the theory of it was free riders welcome. So by God, we got a peep of them. Um, but, but the giving back also was titanic, and that's why having an opportunity to talk about the thing just over the horizon with somebody who has been here since what was just over the horizon was, hey, we could use this stuff, uh, is really very important. The, the other thing is that um, Chris has his, his hand in an awful lot uh, of the projects that are most interesting and exciting in our world right now. It's not just Hyperledger, it's Cloud Foundry, and it's not just Cloud Foundry, it's Node.js. And by the time you get through sort of pawing over the bits in his portfolio, uh, you have both a roster of clients I either have or want, or uh, a, a list of the very important stuff that we get after we stop thinking in terms only of unit operating systems and handsets, when we are actually thinking about the network is the computer. Oh, did I say that? I think it may still be trademarked. Um, uh, but, 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 well, no, Jim Wright isn't going to let you say that. It exists. It's, it, it just exists in a better and transmuted form, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 let's, but let's agree at any rate that, that what I really mean is that the guy who worries about blockchain for IBM uh, is also the guy who has his fingers in almost every other pie that feels to me like over the horizon at the moment. Uh, and so I give you Chris Farris.